you. Thank you all for coming, first of all. Uh, we're so glad to have people come out and hear this fascinating uh, discussion we're going to be having tonight. Unfortunately for you guys, before that fascinating discussion gets going, I have to talk for a while. So please bear with me. Um, we're going to give you a little update on MNMRC because lots of things are happening, lots of things are going on, and we want to make sure everybody's up to speed with all of that. I can figure out how to work this. First of all, we have our annual report, which we've just published for, for 2018. It's now available on our website, and uh, we want you all to take a look, and, and you get to, get to see all the details of the things that I'm going to brush over very quickly tonight. Um, next big idea is on June 12th, we're going to be presenting some brand new, fresh water quality data for South Maui. This is the first time we've presented South Maui data to the community. And we'll be at the Humpback Whale Sanctuary in Kihei. Um, we'd love to have you all come and, and see all this information. It's uh, going to be a very interesting talk, and um, uh, I think it's going to be very, well, very worth your while. So please join us at, uh, at the sanctuary next week. Um, along with that, uh, we've incorporated those results into our annual report for our water quality monitoring program, the Hui Oka Viola. And that's going to be available at the uh, presentation next week, and it will, it'll also be on our website shortly thereafter. Um, water quality, our water quality testing program is evolving. We've been at it for several years now, and we're continuing to do our 39 sites, but now we're starting to look at other ways to, to assess water quality. One of those is to look at Limu. It turns out that Limu accumulate good things and bad things that are in the water. And if you analyze the limu, you can see not just what's happening at a point in time, but what's happening over a period of time. And that can give us a whole different way of looking at, looking at our near shore waters. So that's beginning, uh, beginning soon. We're now getting organized to do that, and it seems to be very exciting. We've also added water quality monitoring sites in Ma'alaya Harbor and Ma'alaya Bay, because as part of our oysters in the water project, which is moving along, I'll tell you about that in a moment, we need to make sure our oysters can survive in Ma'alaya Harbor, because if we, can, if we can succeed in that, we can make a big water quality difference in that area. And so our water quality testing program is now establishing baselines and looking at other uh, important parameters that, that we think are going to be important for our oysters. Associated with that, one of the things that we've learned about the water quality in Ma'alai Harbor is that it can be pretty bad at times. It can go chocolate on us anytime there's a storm. Turns out there's a reason for that, which is that the watershed above Ma'alai Harbor, called Popatea, is a very troubled watershed. It's very subject to fire. It's very subject to, to hot, very extremely dry and extremely windy conditions. And so we've, we've put together a project to see what we can do to mitigate all these harms that are coming downstream into the waters and damaging the reef, damaging the oysters, damaging uh, everything that's going on in Ma'alai Bay and Ma'alai Harbor. Looks like our, pro our project, uh, uh, we've done a research report on that and our project is going to begin with the fire mitigation problem, which is kind of the most urgent thing we, we see going on there. Um, the oysters, we have our permits from the state of Hawaii now, which will allow us to, to put our first experimental oysters in the water. We're now working out a memorandum of understanding with the port operator, so we make sure we don't disrupt their ordinary, their daily operations. But this year, we hope that we will finally be able to put, put our oysters in the water and begin working on uh, the water quality in, the, in that harbor. We just purchased uh, a new uh, water quality testing piece of equipment, which we're very excited about, which is a real-time uh, probe or sun, uh, which we are now learning how to use. And we will be using that in Ma'alai Harbor and other places as we, uh, as we proceed to, to test things that we can't test now and to test things at different locations, different depths, uh, and to get real-time results. This is funded by uh, a grant from a Lush Cosmetics Company, and we're very excited to, to begin dipping our toe in that kind of water. We're continuing to work on sunscreen. You all know, I'm sure you've all switched your sunscreens away from the toxic kinds that are hurting our coral reefs right now, away from ox ox uh, oxybenzone and octanoxate, towards the mineral sunscreens that use zinc and titanium. 
the ones that are much less harmful to, to our reefs. And uh, we're, we're working on education of that. We've gotten uh, Whole Foods to join us in our campaign, and we're hoping to get other other vendors to do us, to, to do so as well. It's a it's a process. We're not going to get them out of Hawaii for another year or so, but we are going to get them out, and things will. We expect our reefs to really strongly benefit from that once we get that done. Uh, lastly, um, all this work that we do needs support, and we get a lot of support from a lot of different donors, a lot of different from our county government, from the state government, and we also need help from you. So if you get a chance, pick up your phone, turn the turn the ringer off, but then maybe you can send a text message, uh, and all of a sudden you'll we'll have a very easy way for you to uh, donate a few bucks to support the cause here at, at Nine Erie Marine Resource Council. Okay, advertising over. Let me introduce our speakers for tonight. Our speaker for tonight. One moment. Our speaker tonight is Sarah Jane Light Severino. Did I say that right? Light like a light bulb. Light. Sarah Jane Light Severino. Thank you. Uh, Sarah is a graduate student at uh, uh, University of Hawaii. She earned her Master's of Science in Marine Science at Hawaii Pacific University. Um, for her Master's the thesis, she developed the, the fluorescence census technique that uses natural fluorescent pigmentation found within some corals to non-destructively analyze their small size, size, their various size classes in C2 under daylight conditions. Very interesting technique. After grad school, she became a first mate on, uh, the, on the Koholo, which is Hawaii, Hawaii Pacific University's research vessel for two years. Um, she was also recruited by the Navy to manage field operations for a project studying the structure of marine resources in Pearl Harbor. Sarah's been working toward establishing a biological carrying capacity for Hanama Bay Marine Life Conservation District. Turn the page. Uh, she, she performed various field experiments in order to quantify changes in the benthic community uh, of reefs in, in Hanama Bay, and also to assess the uh, response to human activity in that, in that very, very crowded area. Um, she's accompanied tonight by Kule Rogers, who is her, uh, I guess, the assistant advisor, I'm not sure if it's Charles, but uh, also a very well built, very important scientist from the University of Hawaii. Um, Dr. Rogers has been working at the Institute of Marine Biology uh, in the Coral Reef Ecology Lab since 1992 under the direction of Drs. Paul Jokiel and Fanny Cox. And uh, she became the principal investigator of the Ecology Lab, the Coral Reef Ecology Lab, in 2016. Over 100 of her articles have been published in peer-reviewed journals, published reports, and conference proceedings. She was in the top five most read peer J journal articles in 2017. Since 2005, she's provided a graduate, undergraduate advising, graduate advising, mentoring, and training for 15 grad students, 40 undergrads, interns, technicians, and two postdocs. In addition to that, in her free time, she's been heavily involved as principal investigator, co-principal investigator, <laughs> Okay, yes, thank you for coming out tonight to hear about how we are quantifying the extent of human use on the marine resources within Hanama Bay on Oahu, Hawaii. So 80% of our visitors to Hawaii participate in some type of ocean-related activity, such as snorkeling, scuba diving, kayaking, or surfing. This provides over $800 million to our economy each year. And this provides many jobs, as well as um, it can foster different environmental awareness and um, education. So, <laughs> of course there are unintended impacts of tourism, such as overuse of an area or incorrect use of an area, so that would be 
walking around, stomping, or stepping on the reef flat. Um, this, per, this does show stress on our marine life, so in the way of dolphin tours, we can see that dolphins are producing excess stress hormones such as cortisol in response to increased boating. We can see that fish may change their behavior in response to increased snorkeling, and we've experienced corals that have been trampled and are left with little blue specks in their skeletons as evidence of trampling. All of these are localized stressors that then translate onto the reduced resilience in the face of global climate change. Tonight, we're going to be talking about Hanama Bay, our most snorkeled reef in the Hawaiian Islands, although it was not always this way. In the 1980s, like you see in this top picture, the bay was only visited by Hawaiian royalty and this was for recreation and fishing. It wasn't until 1928 when the bay was deeded to princess, or deeded by Hawaiian princess Bernice Pauahi Bishop to the city and county of Honolulu that it became a public place to visit. By the 1950s, 50,000 visitors annually were visiting the bay, and because of this increased popularity, they then decided to make an access road. They made a staircase down the crater. They blasted three swimming holes with the use of dynamite, and sand was imported to the beach. In 1967, Hanama Bay became the first no-take marine life conservation district in Hawaii. And by 1975, we saw a half a million visitors already coming to the bay. In 1981, they started to place their first restrictions at Hanama Bay, trying to attempt parking restrictions as well as restrictions on com commercial operations on the weekends. However, these restrictions did not work as well as they intended. By the late 1980s, the bay was receiving 3.6 million visitors annually. People were dropped off by the bus load. Da coming down to the beach, almost 13,000 visitors came to the beach per day. Crowds were noticed stirring up sand. They were dropping trash, feeding the fish, and there was also noticed a slick of sunscreen on the bay's surface. Other people noticed other people accounted that the tourists were walking out onto the reef flat to feed fish and observe them from a standing up position. Um, so city and county realized that this could not be sustainable and therefore they started to take firm action in 1999. They strictly enforced a 300 car parking rule um, tour companies were no longer to drop were no longer allowed to drop off visitors by the busload, and the park was closed on Wednesday mornings. City and county also asked um, the University of Hawaii Sea Grant, Friends of Hanama Bay, and volunteers to help implement an education program to foster reef etiquette. In 1996, they started charging an admissions of three dollars, which was later bumped up to seven fifty. In 1998, they began a closure of the bay on Tuesdays, which still holds true today. And in 1999, they successfully enforced a fish feeding ban. They conducted the first and only previous biological carrying capacity study, and the Coral Reef Ecology Lab implemented two long-term monitoring sites on the outer reef um, as part of the coral reef assessment and monitoring program. Are these restrictions working? That's what everyone wants to know. But we haven't had a biological carrying capacity study performed since the restrictions were in place in 2000. So what we did this first year of our biological carrying capacity study is looked at what they did in 2000 tried to build on their experiment, also take experiments that have been done in the past 20 years, build on those, but also ask the questions that haven't been looked at. So the biological carrying capacity study at Hanama Bay was designed to determine the acceptable limits of use within the bay. 
our first task, oh, the first year of the study looks at these resources as they relate to corals. Um, our first task was to compile historical studies and data sets performed within Hanama Bay. So this tells us exactly what has been done and what hasn't been done in the Bay. It also offers managers a really good place to find all the studies to reference. Our second task was to look at human counts. So it's not good enough to say, oh, I think there are a bunch of people in Keyhole. We want to quantify this. We want to put a number on it, how many people are using each sector of the bay. And we did this to identify high and low use areas. Our third task was to perform a direct human use impact monitoring study. We did this in relation to these human counts and we looked at things like coral trampling, sedimentation, and coral colony surveys. Both the human use counts and direct human impact monitoring were performed in June and October of last year for 30 days. All of these studies were performed within the bay here. This is Hanauma Bay and um, there are five quadrants of the bay, back doors, keyhole, channel, which is brew and offshore. What we did here is we broke the bay further down into transect levels. So you see 11 up here. Um, so what we did is we placed a transect in most of these 11 trans or in most of these 11 sectors outlined by red. And these transects were five by 15 meters in area. All of our experiments were, and our human use counts were over these transects that you see here. So for the rest of the study, when I talk about transects, there are all the stars up there. So let's look at our human use counts. Like I was saying, we wanted to monitor the spatial and activity patterns of human use within Hanama Bay, and we did this two ways. We used time-lapse photos, so we've placed out three of these cameras that you can see up here. We have back doors east, one that overlooked back doors east, keyhole, and, chan and offshore east, one that overlooked keyhole west, channel, and offshore west, and one that overlooked witches brew area. So these photos were taken on the hour from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. I would then download all these photos, bring them back to the lab, and count all the people. <laughs> Don't worry, it's not good enough resolution where I can zoom into people. <laughs> um, so the other way that we did this was by visual human surveys. So I would go up to the top, I would walk myself up that hill. If you've been there, you know it's a workout. Um, I'd walk myself up that hill and take these counts at 8 a.m., 11 a.m., and 2 p.m. So these counts were taken over 10 randomly selected days over those 30-day studies, and these included at least one of each weekend day and a holiday. So then I could average the amount of people over that time. So let's look at what we found. What are the visitors doing and when? Well, the majority of people, 41%, are on the beach. 30% are swimming or snorkeling, and 29% are waiting. We can see here that the most popular snorkeling, in, or the most popular sites in general are keyhole and channel sectors, and that our most popular time of day to visit Hanoma is 11 a.m. So what we're more interested in are the marine resources. So let's take a look at what these, what these visitors are doing when they get in the water. Where are they snorkeling? So the majority of snorkeling, 90% of it, happens in that keyhole channel sectors. And then about 4% happens in backdoors and 3% in both offshore and witches brew sector. Now that we've quantified the amount of use in each sector, we can look at how this relates to our coral trampling experiments, our sedimentation experiments, and our coral cover surveys. So 
for our coral skeleton trampling experiments. We placed out dead coral skeletons, 70 total, seven at each of the transects, and we did semi-daily swims to document presence absence of these coral skeletons because a lot of them would just be gone in some of the sectors from day to day, so we looked at that. We also took weekly top-down photographs. So on Tuesdays, we went out there and took their picture to quantify the percent loss over that week. Here is an example. We have one example from Keyhole and one example from Witches Brew. If you remember, Keyhole is our most popular snorkel site and Witches Brew is our least popular inshore snorkel site. So we'd go out there, take these top-down photos, go back to the lab, and take their top-down areas. We then did this for five consecutive weeks, and yes, we did this for five consecutive weeks, and we watched how their, their coral skeletons would break over this time. So we see not so much loss in Witch's Brew, but more loss here in Keyhole. So Keyhole sector was actually our sector that had the most full colony mortality, so the whole, in the whole colony was wiped out. It was about 50% of the colonies in Keyhole were gone by the end of it, and Witch's Brew lost no full colonies. So let's look at partial mortality or partial breakage of these colonies. In channel, keyhole, and back doors, we saw the highest partial breakage of colonies, whereas in Witch's Brew and offshore, we saw a lesser amount of breakage. What's interesting here is that Witch's Brew and offshore saw the same amount of breakage when offshore was actually our control site. So if you place skeletons out too deep for people to trample, then that breakage can't be because of the trampling. That breakage has to be due to something else. So what we're thinking here is that it's due to wave action or fish bites. So what we notice is that the same amount of breakage happens offshore as in Witch's Brew, which has very little amount of snorkelers in it. So this is probably due to environmental, environmental factors. The other interesting thing, which I'm sure you're all thinking, is back doors. Back doors only saw 4% of snorkelers and waders. So that's not much more than our Witch's Brew and offshore sites, but much less than keyhole and channel, but we're seeing a, a similar amount of breakage here. And what we'd like to think here to explain this breakage is that back doors is our waviest sector. So it sees a lot of breaking waves. So there could be some loss of skeleton due to that. And at the same time, we did observe fish bites on these skeletons as well as live colonies in the area. So that is prevalent in that sector. Here on the y-axis, we have average percent skeletal loss per day, and on the x-axis, we have percent swimmers and waders for both June and October. You can see here that as swimming and wading increases, the coral trampling also increases for both months. Another one of the things that we looked at was a visual water clarity distance. So why does this matter? Well, if there's a lot of particulates in the water column, maybe the symbionts within the corals cannot photosynthesize as well as they want to. Also, we see these particulates fall down to live corals, and if they're sand, what they can do is slosh around in the waves and actually cause something called sand scour, which basically acts as sandpaper on these live coral colonies. So we wanted to get an idea of the visual water clarity in Hanalma Bay to look at this. To do this, we took a Secchi disk measurement. So most of the time, as you can see in this photo, you take these Secchi disk measurements over the horizontal, over the vertical water column. So it'll be longer, you'll have a longer distance in clearer water and a shorter distance in cloudy water. Because Hanalma is so, sh is so shallow, 
we took this over a horizontal distance. So the way this works is you go out with your buddy, one buddy holds on to this white disc here while the other buddy swims away with a measuring tape. That buddy is looking at the disc the entire time and as soon as they can no longer see the disc, then they record that value of distance. They swim further away to eliminate bias and then start swimming back toward the disc and as soon as they can see it, they then record that distance. You take an average of these two distances to get your visual water clarity distance. So we performed these secu disc measurements over all inshore transects directly after the 11 a.m. counts. So these were also performed on those randomly selected 10 days. Um, it's important at this time to also record things like time of day, cloud cover, wave height, or tidal fluctuations because these will impact your secu disc measurements. It isn't just because human use. <laughs> So what we found is that water visibility was approximately 30% clearer on closed days than on open days. And you can see that here in this bar graph, these darker bars refer to open days and these lighter white and light gray bars refer to closed days. So we can see that in each sector we've had greater visibility on days where the bay was closed. Um, what we also noticed, though, is that these measurements are very much correlated with things like tidal flux, so how far apart are the low lows and the high highs, wind speed, direction, wave height, and cloud cover. The second thing that we did when we, wanted, when we measured sediment is that we looked at how much was depositing onto the reef. So we know how much is in the water column, but how much is falling down to the reef and possibly smothering corals that now have to slough off excess mucus, providing energy toward this, and could reduce their resilience. So how did we do this? We placed one sediment trap at the beginning and one sediment trap at the end of each transect. The traps were out for approximately 30 days unless they swam off, and in that case, we promptly replaced them. All of the sediment accumulation values were standardized over the time that the traps were out in the field. So here we have um, our bay, and all of the sectors are outlined by colors corresponding to their swimming and wading pressure. All of these dots that you're seeing are size gradients as well as color gradients to help distinguish between the different amounts of sediment accumulation in each sector. Overall, what we found is a significant correlation between proportion of visitors swimming and wading in each area and the sediment accumulation within traps. Another interesting thing that we found is that October had much higher sediment accumulation than in June. We also looked at coral colony surveys. So we documented the size and coverage of corals, the coral species, growth orientation, so whether they were on a vertical or horizontal surface or within a crack or crevice, partial mortality, new breakage, disease, feeding scars, and rugosity. Rugosity may be the one that people are least familiar with. So rugosity is the spatial complexity of a reef flat. So how many nooks and crannies are there? So for example, if you have a reef flat that has low rugosity, it may look very flat. Whereas if you have a reef flat that has high rugosity, it'll have a bunch of ups and downs, lots of vertical substrate for things to settle in. So we found 13 species of hard coral within the inner reef flat of Hanalma Bay. Our most dominant were the encrusting rice Montipera capitata and encrusting ringed rice Montipera petula within channel sector. We then found the mounding brown lobe coral Parides evermanii and encrusting sandpaper coral Sammacora nostrazi within both backdoors and witches brew area, and the robust cauliflower coral Poslopora meandrina within channel sector. 
Overall, we saw a high species diversity despite having low coral cover within the inshore reef. Let's look a little more into this. So, we can see that the inner reef is very, di is very different in its coral cover. We have um, less than 1% of coral cover within Keyhole West and almost 13% coral cover within Channel West. So, to put this in context, our reefs around Hawaii have an average of 22% coral cover. We then can look at Channel East, Channel West, and Witches Brew, which are our highest coral cover sectors. We can use the experiments previously mentioned to understand why we have such low and high coral cover within the bay. Keyhole was highest in usage, coral breakage, and sediment accumulation. While channel sector was moderate in all of these, but also provided the highest rugosity of any channel of any sector and also the most vertical substrate. The longer you snorkel around Hanama Bay, the more you notice that all of the corals here are either mounding, encrusting, or robust in their skeletal formation. As we can see by the Parides evermanii up here, up at that top left, and the um, cauliflower coral over here. We also notice a vertical growth formation. So instead of growing on the horizontal substrate like you normally see, all of these corals that are very large in Keyhole Channel that, account, that accounted for the majority of coral cover were growing on this vertical substrate. So in these little kind of caves in the reef or such as this cauliflower coral here in a crevice, so our spatial distribution and abundance of corals within Hanauma Bay, at least on the shallow reef flat, reflects a historic chronic impact of human use. Lastly, for coral reef surveys, we assess the health of corals within transects. Coral bleaching is a stress response by corals and their symbiotic algae with an observed loss in pigmentation. Dr. Paul Jokiel, the founder of the Coral Reef Ecology Lab, first noted bleaching at the Kahe Power Point before a bleaching event had come to Hawaii. He then brought corals into the lab and simulated a bleaching event and found that corals bleach at one to two degrees Celsius above their summertime maximum. During in 2015, we saw a bleaching event here in Hawaii, and the Coral Reef Ecology Lab went to Hanama Bay to survey the health of corals. They noticed that all the corals within these transects bleach around 50%. They saw 50% bleaching and paling in corals. Three months later, they came back to survey the corals and noticed that many of them had recovered, but they did suffer 9.8% suffer mortality. To put this in context, Kaneohe Bay on the eastern side of Oahu suffered 22% mortality and some sites on West Hawaii saw anywhere from 50 to 80% of mortality. So why did Hanama Bay not see as much mortality as these other sites? They found that current patterns within the bay might offer some of this information on why areas bleach and why some areas do not or why some areas recover. So the longer a parcel of water sits on the reef flat and the slower it moves, the more it accumulates heat. So really we want these very quick velocity currents. The other thing the Coral Reef Ecology Lab noted is that they wanted to know more about what happens to the corals as they're bleaching. So traditional coral health surveys in times of bleaching survey bleaching on a four point scale. They look at live, pale, bleached, or dead. So they wanted to know what's actually happening to this coral. So think about when you go to the doctor for a checkup and he says, congratulations, you're alive until you're dead. That doesn't really help you. So we want to understand what is going on in these corals as they're stressing. 
And to do so, we developed a tool that anyone can use to help determine levels of bleaching and corresponding health parameters. So what we did is we took in common coral species within the Hawaiian Islands, brought them into the lab, and simulated a bleaching event. During our simulated bleaching, we had professional photographers, Kaoki and Yuko Stender, come in to photograph these and capture their color. At that same time, we looked at the different health conditions, such as photosynthetic state, lipopulc amplitude modulator, symbiont density, and chlorophyll concentration. This gave us a method of studying coral bleaching along the color gradient that serves as a proxy for coral health. Coral bleaching events are becoming more frequent, more frequent and more severe. This summer, we actually know a coral reef watch here is predicting a severe bleaching event in August and September. So if you would like to find out more information about that, please feel free to write down this thing. Um, in, before this happens, though, you want to know how your reef is doing. So you want to take before, during, and after information about your reef. So we went out to Hama at each of these transects, and we used the color card to survey the colors. Here I have highlighted the um, bleach, the total bleach category. Luckily, in October, none of our corals were bleached in Hanama. So we'll continue to survey throughout the bleaching events look at their health. If anyone here is interested in helping us document this summer's bleaching event at your favorite reef, please come and talk to me after the presentation to receive your very own pull of cards. <laughs> Another thing that's very important to look at is temperature. So we have loggers throughout the major, all the major sectors of Panama Bay that measure temperature on a 15 minute scale. So every 15 minutes, what's the temperature? And here's the data. So we place these out prior to the 2015 bleaching event. And here we can see that spike. It, during the bleaching event in September. We can see that max, average, and min are all elevated compared to consecutive years. Then we look at the longest term data set that we have for Hanama Bay, the Coral Reef Assessment and Monitoring Program, which I'll refer to as CRAM. These sites were set up in 1999, and at each of the crab sites throughout the main Hawaiian Islands, there are two, sets, two sites with a shallow and a deep location, so 10 feet and 30 feet. At each of these, there are 10 10 meter transects where they document coral cover, richness, diversity, algal and substrate cover. Here we have our crab results from 1999 all the way to 2018. First, we'll look at this gray line showing the shallow coral reef assessment and monitoring site at Hanama. We see that it's in a constant decline until about 2012, when then it starts increasing from 9.6% coral cover to 14.7% coral cover. Our deep site shown in the black line. There's a large decrease in coral cover after 2012, which is associated with this 2014-15 bleaching event that we were talking about earlier. But despite these decreasing trend lines at both of the sites, we have seen increases in coral cover or stability over the past two years. Let's look at how these sites um, relate to the rest of the sites around the main Hawaiian Islands. So here is the Coral Reef Assessment and Monitoring Program map. They have sites throughout the entire marine, or the entire main Hawaiian islands. We can see here on the map that there are dark arrows and light arrows. The dark arrows correspond to significant increases and decreases, whereas the light arrows respond to, or correspond to non-significant increases or decreases. 
So one thing that they found, all of these surveys were taken prior to the 2015 bleaching event, by the way. So what they found prior to the 2015 bleaching event is that Maui actually had the most significant decreases in coral cover of any of the islands. And Hawaii Island had the most significant increases in coral cover of any of the Hawaiian islands. Maui had eight of 20 sites that experienced significant declines in coral cover and two stations that experienced significant increases in coral cover and that's Kanahana Bay and Kaikili. So let's talk a little bit about Maui's most snorkeled reefs. Molokini, I'm sure you all know more about this topic than I do, um, but there are mooring permits out there, so that's great because they're not allowing anchoring anymore. Um, also, DLNR is working toward reducing crowding, increasing reef etiquette, and increasing Molokini specific knowledge. Um, the cramp site at Molokini has not seen an incre a significant increase or decrease in coral cover since 1999. Recently, DLNR stated that although the reef habitat appears to remain healthy, the displacement of key reef predators is an indication that high human use is affecting this fully protected reserve. So because Molokini is so deep, you can't really do trampling um, experiments like what we performed in Hanama Bay. But trampling experiments have been performed at a Hihikinau Reserve. So here we have, in 2008, Dr. Rogers and Dr. Joe Keel performed a trampling experiment at, along 18 sites from La Perouse all the way to Kanahana Bay. Um, they found that the highest risk site was what's called Montipara Pond. So it's outlined in red here. And the reason why it was the highest risk site is because they not only noticed trampling damage on the corals, but they also noticed that the corals here were very weak in skeletal structures. So if you look at this diagram here, we're going from cauliflower coral, lobe coral, finger coral, and rice coral in skeletal strength. So Montipara Pond had very weak skeletal structure corals that were dominant. Two other moderate risk sites were the aquarium and third cove. The reason why these were moderate risk and not high risk is because they did exhibit corals of the stronger skeletal strengths. Overall, what they found is that areas that had high snorkeling also had less coral cover in shallow areas. And in response to this study, they implemented a ranger monitoring program, several informational signs across the entryways, which were great. Um, so in summary, there is not sufficient evidence to support the statement that declines in coral cover are the exclusive result of visitor presence at Hanama Bay Nature Preserve. However, we have strong supporting evidence that human use is a contributing factor. So we have this in rates of coral breakage being strongly correlated with human counts. The greater number of visitors in a sector, the lower the coral cover in coral surveys. Coral morphologies within the bay are conducive to high impact areas. Cramp sites that are in areas beyond snorkeling depth have high coral cover. Water clarity increases an average of 30% on days where the bay is closed and sedimentation levels were highly correlated with visitor presence in each sector. Next steps, so next year what we hope to do is put in experimental cages, so exclusion cages that would keep out people and fish, so it's nice to not have your experiments swimming away from you, so that'll be, that'll be really nice for me. Um, we'll also be documenting the benthic co composition within these cages and see how it changes with less visitor presence and also with less herb herbivores and coralivores. 
We'll also be looking at coral recruitment within these cage treatments. Um, we're currently applying for permits to place out coral fragments to track their growth within these cage treatments. We'll be performing reef surveys and we'll be looking at other aspects of carrying capacity. So right now we're looking at biological carrying capacity, but it's much more than that. It's social carrying capacity, so this is very subjective. It's kind of how close you feel you are to your neighbor and how close is too close. A physical carrying capacity, so how many people can physically fit on the beach. And a facilities carrying capacity, how many people can the bathroom support, can the shower support, or can use the trash cans. We're going to be providing many management recommendations after this first year. The first of which is to implement a weather station. So we would like to know the environmental impact, or the environmental um, so we want to know the irradiance, we want to know the wind speed as it relates to Hanauma Bay. Um, we would also like to increase the park fee to $10. So the extra $250 would go to supporting the weather station, but also to increasing a Division of Aquatic Resources presence at the bay. We would like to place TVs within the Sea Grant educational video room. So as you come into the bay, you have to watch an education video. And if you speak a different language other than English, you have the option to pick up a headset, but you also have the option to not. And therefore, if you place these TVs around so that people can just walk over, it might be easier to read in your language than to have to go out of your way to pick up a headset. We would also like to place trails along deeper parts of the reef so that we can aggregate people to these deeper parts instead of the shallower parts and place informational signage. We would like to mirror what they're doing at Ahihikinau Reserve and provide tourists with an idea of where a safe place to enter the bay could be and informational signs on etiquette. We would also like to place signs around telling about the ongoing research within the Bay. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, it's been great.